One of the most powerful tools we have in building a splitting field is taking an extension of an extension. And the Tower Law tells us what happens when we take an extension of an extension. It says that if k, l, and m are fields, and l is a finite extension of k, and m is a finite extension of l, so we're taking here a finite extension of a finite extension, the Tower Law is going to give us some insight into the structure of m as an extension of k. In other words, if we take a finite extension of a finite extension, what is the relationship of the biggest extended field here to the smallest base field? As an example, let's take k to be the rational field and l to be the Gaussian rationals, q adjoined with i. That's a finite extension of degree 2. How do we know? Because a generic element in q adjoined i can be written as a plus bi, where a and b are rational numbers. This means that 1 and i form a basis for the Gaussian rationals over q. They're rationally independent because we can't have a plus bi equals 0 unless a and b are both 0. Now let's adjoin the real cube root of 2 to the Gaussian rationals to get the biggest extended field, q adjoined with i and the real cube root of 2. What's a basis for that biggest field over its base field? We get the real cube root of 2 to be nu, but because this biggest thing is a field, we also have to have its square, 2 to the 2 thirds. And a generic element can be written as a linear combination of 1, the cube root of 2, and the cube root of 4, 2 to the 2 thirds, where the coefficients of that combination now are taken from q adjoin i, so they're Gaussian rational numbers, c, d, and e here belong to q adjoin i. So a basis for the biggest field here over the intermediate field is 1, 2 to the 1 third, and 2 to the 2 thirds. We're pretty comfortable that those are rationally independent. We proved that in a previous video. So now the question is, if we want to understand m as an extension of k, the biggest field as an extension of the smallest field, what we'd like to do is find a basis, as explicitly as we can, for the biggest field, here q adjoined with i and the cube root of 2, over the smallest field, which in this case is just the rationals. So again, a generic element of q adjoined with i and the cube root of 2 can be written as c times 1 plus d times the cube root of 2 plus e times the square of the cube root of 2, 2 to the 2 thirds, where c, d, and e, we said, belong to the Gaussian rational field. But now we just have to make those numbers remember who they are. Because they're Gaussian rationals, c, d, and e can all be written as something times 1 plus something times i, where those somethings are all rational numbers. That's going to be our key observation, because it's going to let us plunk a0 plus b0i, a1 plus b1i, a2 plus b2i in place of c, d, and e in this generic description of one of our numbers in the biggest field. Then all we have to do is simplify by distributing those elements, because it's a field, we know we have the distributive property. And once we've distributed everything and gotten a0, b0, a1, b1, a2, b2 by themselves, we find out that they're multiplying the numbers 1, i, 2 to the 1 third, i times 2 to the 1 third, 2 to the 2 thirds, and i times 2 to the 2 thirds. So every element inside this biggest field can definitely be written as a linear combination of a finite number of elements. Therefore, this biggest field is definitely a finite extension of the base field. That's the first conclusion that we can draw about a finite extension of a finite extension. To give you a flavor for what it looks like in the general case, when we extend from k to l, if that's a finite extension, then we have m minus 1, uh, linearly independent over k, elements of l, and then we also have 1, and those taken together form a basis for l over k. Then when we extend from l to m, we have n minus 1 elements which are linearly independent over l that belong to m. And combining those with 1 again, we get a basis for m over l. But when each of those coefficients in a linear combination of m over l remembers its own identity as an extension of k, we end up getting a bunch more elements, where each of my b's pairs up with each of my a's. And so our basis, 
or what we think might be a basis, uh, expands dramatically. But at the very least, every element of M can be expressed as a linear combination of this finite set of elements over K. Therefore, this finite set of elements spans M over K, which proves that M is finite over K. The big question, though, is are these elements necessarily independent, linearly independent, over k? If they are, then they form a basis for m over k, and we can say exactly what is the degree of m over k. Let's check it in our specific case. If we know that 1, 2 to the 1 third, and 2 to the 2 thirds are independent over the Gaussian rationals, then that means that any linear combination of those three things, which equals 0, must guarantee that those coefficients are equal to zero. Where here those coefficients, c, d, and e, belong to the Gaussian rationals. But then, if those coefficients belonging to the Gaussian rationals are multiplying 1, 2 to the 1 third, and 2 to the 2 thirds, we showed that that was equivalent to the six rational numbers, a0, b0, a1, b1, a2, b2, multiplying 1i, 2 to the 1 third, 2 to the 2 thirds, i times 2 to the 1 third, and i times 2 to the 2 thirds. Therefore, this equation is equivalent to the one written at the bottom here. Now we can say that if 0 is equal to a linear combination of those six elements, then c, d, and e have to be 0. But c, d, and e are each written as a0 plus b0, i, and so forth. And if each of those is equal to 0, then the independence of 1 and i over the rationals must guarantee that each of their coefficients is equal to 0. So if a0 plus b0, i is equal to 0, that means that a0 and b0 individually must be 0. Likewise for a1 and b1, and likewise for a2 and b2. So when you look at this logic from start to finish, what we've proven is that any linear combination of 1i, 2 to the 1 third, i times 2 to the 1 third, 2 to the 2 thirds, and i times 2 to the 2 thirds, which equals 0, necessarily guarantees that all of a0, b0, a1, b1, a2, b2 are equal to 0. What have we proven? We've proven that that set of six elements is linearly independent over the rational numbers. Therefore, because it also spans our biggest field over Q, it is a basis for our biggest field over Q. So now that we've discovered a basis for the biggest field over the smallest field, we can look at the general situation and show that this always works. In other words, that not only do these elements span M over K, they're also linearly independent over K. Therefore, they form a basis for m over k, by definition of basis. Now we can talk about degrees. In our example, the degree of our first finite extension from q up to q adjoin i was 2, because there are two elements in its basis. The degree of our second finite extension was 3. And, because we now have explicitly written down a basis for the biggest field over the smallest field, we can see that its degree is equal to 6, the total degree of the extension. All we have to do to prove the general case is just find a way of organizing all of those elements that we now know as a basis for m over k. We have the a's, along with 1, which form a basis for l over k. We have the b's, which along with 1, form a basis for m over l. And then we showed that all of these products of the a's multiplied by the b's will be linearly independent over the base field k. How many of them are there? We have them arranged here in m columns and n rows. And therefore, this set of elements, which is a basis of m over k, has m times n elements. And that's the conclusion that most people consider to be the most useful and important part of the Tower Law. Not just that m is a finite extension of k, but we know exactly what the degree of m over k is going to be is just equal to the product of the degree of m over l times the degree of l over k. So that's the Tower Law. It's one of our most important tools in understanding how, when you extend an extension, if those extensions are finite, then the degrees of those extensions multiply.